Good morning. morning. Welcome to Scout Sunday at Central. Glad you all are here. Today we're going to recognize the achievements of the young men in the back um, and uh, the service that they've been able to give to this community, to this church, and, uh, and, and praise them for everything that they do. So if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you, and I ask, that, well, it, ask you all to please take a moment and fill out the ritual of friendship that's located in your pew. And I'm going to go over some important announcements. First, today is Super Bowl Sunday, and given that we all spend far too much on snacks and entertainment, you'll see buckets located around the church, and I know the youth will be at the doors this evening, <clears throat> or this afternoon after uh, service is concluded. They're going to help you divert some of those funds uh, so that we can turn that into the uh, uh, Anderson Emergency Soup Kitchen. So. Please give generously. And it does look like that we have a host for the game tonight at 232 Bronson. Wait a minute, that's my address. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone's welcome. We'll have a great time. I do ask uh, if you were coming, if you could carpool, that'd be great. Parking will be a little bit limited. There's a lot of construction going on in the area. <clears throat> so in-house preschool registration for church members. It starts tomorrow morning. Forms can be found on the website. Uh, or in the office, and they can be dropped by the preschool office anytime between 7.30 a.m. and 1 p.m. The church committees and the board of deacons will meet this Wednesday, February 5th, and the meal will be served at 5.30, followed by your meetings at 6 p.m. On Thursday, Central Lights will hold their friendship luncheon starting at 12. Cost is $8. And Central's own Annette will be the program, delighting all with her music. And last but not least, troop members will be out front again following the service, uh, with our annual barbecue tickets and camp cards. And I do have a couple of uh, prayer concerns that we want to go over. Uh, Art Phillips will have a procedure to get rid of a kidney stone on Tuesday. Alice McCullum's mom, or uncle, excuse me, Sonny Osley, is in the hospital in Athens after suffering a stroke this week. Prayers are definitely requested for him and for his wife, Frances. And Miriam Halcom will have cataract surgery tomorrow, so please keep them all in your prayers. If you're able, please stand. Join us as we prepare ourselves to receive God's word. Come and hear the words of life. Jesus, Jesus speaks, speaks and we are healed. Come and see God's power in action. Jesus, Jesus transforms with a touch. Come and know the love of Christ. Jesus is our living Lord. Let us worship our King in heaven who heals and restores us every day.
scouts are trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Because of such great mercy, God is, God is ready to forgive all the ways we fail to live in faithfulness. Relying on that mercy, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Healing God, trust in you does not always come easy. When each day we are faced with the ugliness of the world, we do not believe that love conquers fear. We are not convinced that power comes through weakness. We cannot conceive how you could heal us. Forgive our lack of faith, O oh God, and renew our trust in you, for we will be disciples of Jesus. Amen. If the Lord kept count of all our sins, who could stand? But with God there is forgiveness. Christ gives us peace. Thanks be to God. Emily, can you be my helper, please? Very easy job. Okay, Daniel, be my helper. Okay, you hold this. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So glad to see you all. Today, I want to talk about plants. Raise your hand if you've helped in the yard or in your family garden, or maybe growing a plant before. Raise your hands. Me too. I'm not very good at it. I have to remember to water them. That is the key. To me, my favorites are flowers. Who is with me? Who loves flowers? Oh, I love the flowers, especially the ones in the back of the church. Well, today, I brought a new flower I just planted in this pot. You can hold it out and show all the kids what's in the pot. What's in the pot? What's in there? What's over here? Oh, Soil. yes. Soil, dirt, yes. That's what's in there. There's also a seed in there. There's no flower yet, but here's a picture. It's a marigold. This is what it's eventually going to look like. I couldn't find any marigolds that were already in season. So I, I printed one off. This is what it's going to look like when it grows. I'm so excited. They're yellow and orange, and I just love them. Did you know that to get from this pot of dirt to this flower takes a lot of time? And you have to be patient, and you have to water the flower, and you have to give it sunlight. In today's Bible story, you may wonder where this is going with the Bible story. But um, we learned that Jesus took his time. He did not rush around like a chicken with his head cut off. In today's lesson, while Jesus is walking through a town, about the size of Anderson, we'll say, he, a man called out to him saying, Jesus, Jesus, come and heal my daughter. She's very, very sick. And Jesus went along that way. He was walking, you can walk with me too. And then all of a sudden, he felt someone touch his, the hem or the bottom, the cloak that he was wearing. 
And there was a woman who had been sick for 12 years. Can you imagine being sick for 12 years? And Jesus said, your faith has made you well. So he healed her. And on the way to, jo to the man's house, someone come out, came out and said, your daughter has already died. You know what? Jesus kept going to that man's house, and he went inside the house, and he said the words, little girl, get up. And do you know what happened? The girl got up. That's right. That's awesome. The girl got up. Jesus healed both the woman and the child. He brought her back to life. You see, Jesus offers us his time. There's a lot of us on the world, but God, to Jesus and God, you are so individually special that God takes time with you to nourish you, comfort you, encourage you. He is patient with us. And so he takes his time. He doesn't rush about, but he takes his time. And when we come to God in prayer, we take that time to be with God as well, as God takes his time with us. So, what did we learn today? Jesus takes and I, yes, Jesus takes his time with us. And that's a great gift that he gives us. So let's say a prayer. We're going to stick our hands up in the air like we're praising God. Give us some spirit fingers. Put our hands together like we're the church and bring Jesus into our hearts. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving us so much time and not rushing about, but you take time to hear us and comfort us and heal us and encourage us. We love you and may we love others because you first loved us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you. Now you can either go out this door to um, Children's Church or go back to your seats. If you would please join me with prayer for elimination. By the power of your spirit, speak your word to us, O Lord God. Show us who you are and who you are calling us to be. For the sake of your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
very much. Powerful. If you'd like to follow the scripture reading today, it's found on page 39 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. It's Mark 5, verses 21 through 43. It is two stories, as Noel said, a story within a story. So Scott and I will both be reading to dramatize that. Listen for the word of God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? But he looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, come, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this portion of the word for our understanding and living. Amen. We're looking at two more miracle stories today. Miracle stories are definitely an emphasis in Mark's gospel. I've told you before that one third of Mark's gospel is taken up by telling about the last week of the life of Jesus. And another third of Mark's gospel is taken up by telling miracle stories. In Matthew, at this point of the year, we would be immersed in the Sermon on the Mount and its teachings. In Luke, we would be immersed in the parables of Jesus. In John, we would be immersed in the I am sayings and the metaphorical teachings about the vine and the branches and the good shepherd. In Mark, we're studying miracle stories. And in most cases, when we study these stories in Mark, we find that the true focus of the stories is the people, not the miracles. What do these stories tell us about Jesus And what do they tell us about the people he cared for? Last week we saw Jesus in Gentile territory, healing a demoniac whose life was so far off the rails that he was not only a danger to other people but to himself. When the fearful residents of that community asked Jesus to go away, Jesus didn't respond angrily and curse them, he left. But he also told the healed man to go back to his family and community to share the good news of what had been done for him in order to plant some seeds that might bear fruit and faith in the future. 
Today's story is also a fascinating one about people. Jesus and the disciples have now traveled by boat back across the Sea of Galilee to Jewish territory, most likely back to the town of Capernaum, which served as their home base there, though it's not named. When they got out of the boat, immediately a huge crowd surrounded Jesus. The stage is set for two very dramatic stories notable for their contrast. And they are, as you heard, told as a story within a story which highlights those contrasts even more. First, a man named Jairus comes to Jesus with an urgent request. Jairus is the only character in this story who is named other than Jesus and the three disciples. And he's named because everybody knows Jairus. He's a big deal in town. He's one of the leaders of the synagogue. If Jairus had been one of the ones who brought the paralytic to Jesus, they wouldn't have had to dig a hole through the roof to get access to Jesus. The crowd would have parted to allow Jairus to have direct access to Jesus. So now this huge crowd parts and allows Jairus to approach Jesus directly. Remember, though, that synagogues have not entirely been welcoming places for Jesus early in his ministry. Pharisees have criticized him there for such things as healing people on the Sabbath in the synagogue. So I'm guessing it took a lot of courage for Jairus to risk the ire of the Pharisees and come to Jesus in the midst of a huge crowd of people in public. In a way, in doing this, he's giving legitimacy to Jesus. He also knows that Jesus might not welcome him or be disposed to help him because of the reception in the synagogues. But his need is so great that he's willing to take the risk of rejection. He even humbles himself in a way that I doubt he had ever done before in his life by falling down at the feet of Jesus. Over and over he begged Jesus to come to his house because his little daughter was near death. He expressed his faith to Jesus. Come and lay your hands on her so that she might be made well and live. I told you last week that the part of the story last week where the 2,000 pigs stampede into the lake and are drowned would have been a hilarious joke for the Jewish people who viewed pigs as unclean animals. Well, there's some notable context things about today's stories as well. Infant mortality was very high back then, so it was not unusual to lose a child to death. And it was a very patriarchal society, so girls' lives were not valued as highly as boys' lives. For this community leader to leave his wife and his dying child <clears throat> to, go out and seek, to go out and seek a healer of questionable background and publicly humble himself and beg this man to come with him for the sake of a sick daughter was probably seen as beneath him by many of his peers. Jesus doesn't say a word in response to Jairus' request for good or for ill. He just goes. He goes with Jairus. And a huge crowd tags along to see what will happen. And this parade through town and its crowd set the context for the most unusual miracle story in the Gospels. And it is a miracle that could have happened without our ever knowing about it. There was another person who desperately needed Jesus that day. Unlike Jairus, she did not have the status and the credentials that she felt would allow her to approach Jesus directly as Jairus did. She was a woman to begin with, and she had no male who could intercede for her as the daughter of Jairus did. But an even bigger complication was that she had been bleeding for 12 years, which is generally understood to have been menstrual bleeding. If having this debilitating chronic issue was not enough, It was a condition which would permanently label her as ritually unclean by Jewish law. She couldn't marry, she couldn't have children, she couldn't even touch another person without causing that person to become 
ritually unclean by contact. She was isolated from society. At one point, she had had some resources, but she spent everything she had on doctors and cures, and instead of getting better, she's gotten worse, and now she's out of money. She's desperate. The crowd around Jesus creates just the opportunity she needs because she has faith that if she can just get close enough to touch his garments, that will be enough to make her well. So she works her way through the crowd as they move along to get close enough to finally reach out and touch him from behind, touch his cloak, and immediately she could feel the change in her body and she knew that she was healed. What she had not counted on was that Jesus would also feel a change take place in his body as he felt power go out of him. He was caught off guard by that. Maybe he was even surprised that this could happen. So he stopped and he turned around and he looked at the crowd following and asked, who was it that touched me? What a moment fraught with danger for this woman. She has, after all, stolen something. Charles Ahmad Ali writes, she approaches Jesus by stealth behind his back and dare I say, pickpockets his power as the only those who are oppressed and despised know how to do. When Jesus confronts the crowd to find out who has done this, the woman comes forward fearfully and shaking, knowing that she has broken ritual codes by touching a rabbi and that she has stolen from him. But instead of blasting her for her sheer impudence and then hurrying on, to the seemingly more important mission, Jesus affirms her actions and claims her to be his family, calling her daughter. Jesus could have kept going, though. He could have preserved the woman's anonymity and dignity, and we would never know this story. But Jesus wants a relationship. She tells him the whole truth of who she is and what she has done. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. Go in peace, shalom is a word which means wholeness. It far transcends physical healing. It means a wholeness of life in which you can be reintegrated into family and society she is truly made whole. And this is the first time in Mark that Jesus tells someone to go in peace. Julie Morris, interestingly, calls this a story of two leaky bodies. The woman's body has been leaking blood for 12 years. When she touches the cloak of Jesus, she knows that her leaking has stopped and Jesus knows that something has leaked out of him. Ask a surgeon or a doctor if healing people takes something out of you. Ask a teacher if teaching people takes something out of you. Ask a counselor if helping people work through their problems takes something out of you. When we invest ourselves in a task or in other people, power leaks out. Jesus has stopped this urgent journey to the house of Jairus, an important household at the center of Jewish life in this town, to notice and bless a woman who has been unnoticed except to be scorned and shunned for 12 years. She is a nobody, but at this point of, in time, she is at the center of attention for Jesus. Why? Perhaps, Ali writes, because she had the courage to take her healing into her own hands, to break the oppressive codes of the day, to refuse a place on the margins, 
and to challenge the edifice of dehumanizing processes. To top it all off, she has the audacity, nay, the courage, to step forward and admit her illegality and theft to everyone present. This is genuine confession. This woman shows more courage than anyone else in Mark's gospel, except the Syrophoenician woman we will encounter in chapter 7. Well, that's all well and good, but you can imagine Jairus grinding his teeth and feeling mounting panic over his daughter's status while Jesus stands around talking to this nobody. And then word arrives from his home, the word he has dreaded. It's too late. No point now. Don't trouble Jesus anymore. Your daughter is dead. Jesus overheard that and told Jairus, don't fear, just believe. He would not allow the large crowd to go any further with him, just Peter and James and John. They came to the home and the mourners were already outside doing their task of weeping and wailing with grief. Jesus told them to stop because the girl was just sleeping. And they laughed at him, a bitter laughter, I'm sure. Jesus took the parents and the disciples with him to the girl's room. Jesus took the girl by the hand and said, Talitha kum, the Aramaic words which would have been actually spoken by Jesus at the time, which means, little girl, get up. And she got up. She began to walk around. They were all amazed. And we're told now she was 12 years old. If I'd written this sermon a little earlier in the week, I would have changed the sermon title to A Tale of Two Daughters. One had lived a comfortable life as the cherished daughter of community leaders, but death threatened to snuff her life out just as she was reaching womanhood. The other one had been going through hell the entire 12 years that the daughter of Jairus had been alive. And she'd probably wish she was dead numerous times. Jesus cared about them both. It didn't matter that they were both females. It didn't matter that touching either one of them, a bleeding woman or a corpse, would make him unclean by Jewish law. It didn't matter that one father might have been an opponent last week or that the community had written the other one off as of no value more than than 10 years ago. And I think these things are all enormously important as we think about how Jesus views us or how Jesus wants us to view each other. The restoration of family and of community seems to be a huge motivating factor for Jesus. It's a system where nobody else has to lose in order for someone else to win. Matthew Ringe points out that the woman in the crowd is one of several figures in Mark whose healing by Jesus enables them to be reintegrated into various dimensions of society. Nine of the 12 individuals healed by Jesus in Mark, 75% of them, have conditions that were cause for exclusion from community. Seven people had a condition that the Torah specifically labeled as unclean or impure. The leper, the paralytic, the man with the withered hand, Jairus' daughter, the bleeding woman, and two blind men. So when Jesus heals these characters, He removes their uncleanness and enables them to participate fully again in community. The primary effect of Jesus' healing is not just personal, it is social. For in restoring people to full community, he also restores the community. Although Jesus no longer walks the earth today doing miracles in the same way that he did during his life, I think these stories give us a glimpse of the coming kingdom of God. It's a place, this is a kingdom where everyone 
will be valued, where everyone will be welcome, where everyone will be made whole. As we make our way through a broken world towards that day, whenever we attempt to value, welcome, include, and make whole the lives of people, we can also give people a glimpse of that coming kingdom of God. It's a leaky, costly way of life in a world that's based on power and strength and exclusion. May God give us the grace and the courage to live in such a way. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we begin to respond to the call of Jesus in our lives, I invite you to stand and join in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. If you're not familiar with it, it's found in the front of the hymn book before the hymns begin on top of page 35, the Apostles' Creed. Together, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. like to express gratitude to Troop 84 and Pac-15 for making Scout Sunday a part of your routine annually and for all of you for being here this morning. Uh, we are delighted to continue to be in partnership with Scouting. Uh, we welcome all the families of Scouts who are with us today too. Uh, in addition to being our lay leader today, Scott Stewart is the Scout Master currently of Troop 84 and I'll turn it over to you for greetings. Thank you. 
So thank you all for your support. Uh, I will say that I am uh, immensely uh, grateful to be a leader of these young men uh, and to watch uh, what they are able, able to accomplish over the course of a year of service uh, and uh, advancements and everything, just growing, growing as young men in the world. So that's good stuff. I start my seventh year with the troop, uh, affiliated with the troop this year. So, um, you know, they, uh, in an era or an organization where every one, or one in every 100 scouts uh, will complete their journey to Eagle, I've seen 12. It's, it's an amazing what these guys can accomplish when they put their minds to it and with good leadership. And I think that we have that leadership here. Um, we couldn't do it, though, without your support and everything that you give to us. So today uh, on Scout Sunday, we give back. The pack is going to have 15 dozen donuts out back uh, after the service, so uh, I hope you're hungry. <laughs> Please eat up. And we are going to give 10% of our troop balance to the church for everything that you guys have done. So I'll make sure to put that in the box. Um, and that's, that's really it. We've just done an amazing, we've had an amazing week, uh, an amazing year. Uh, we will actually be heading to sea base for another high adventure in, two, in 2021, uh, where the boys that get to go will live on a ship for a week, uh, sailing around the Florida Keys. So who wouldn't love that, right? Um, so yes. Yeah. So thank you again for everything that you do. Thank you to you for being here and for uh, for all that you guys do and give back to us in return. Thank you. Now let's unite our hearts in prayer. God, we're thankful to you for the beauty of this day and for your creating it and giving us the opportunity to live in it. Pray that you will help us to make a difference by the way we live today. We thank you for all who are gathered here, especially grateful for scouting organization for Troop 84, which has been a part of this church since I think it's 1929, and Pack 15, which is a recent addition. We're grateful for all those who have come through those organizations and uh, which have found that it made a difference in their lives and their community. Pray for those who are serving as leaders now of the Troop and Pack, and we're grateful for them and their gift of time and talent in doing that. Pray that you'll continue to make a difference in the lives of young men and women through Scouts. We offer our prayers today for those who are struggling, for those who are sick, for those who are uh, going through treatments for illnesses, for those who are in hospitals, nursing homes. We pray for doctors and nurses who are caring for them and for family members who are caregivers. Pray that your, your healing presence will be with each one, uh, granting grace and hope and peace to all. God, we offer our prayers for our community, for our state and nation, for our world, for our leaders. Pray your strength and grace and wisdom. Pray for those in the armed services who serve uh, far from home and in harm's way. We pray your safekeeping for them. We pray for those working far from home in the Peace Corps and as missionaries and other uh, service, ministry, compassion roles. We ask that you'll be with them all. We're grateful for their service. We ask that you'll fill us with joy as we leave this place today and with your peace, that you'll send us forth to tell the good news of what you have done in our lives through Jesus Christ. We ask all of these things in the name of the Savior who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship God as stewards of what we have been given, presenting God's tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
thankful to you for the many ways in which you have blessed and enriched our lives, not only with resources, but also with relationships, uh, with people who have mentored and cared for us, uh, with the opportunity we have to share. We ask your blessing upon these gifts that we have brought today, that you use them for the building of your kingdom. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> 